Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Academy for Eating Disorders webinar entitled Severe and Enduring Anorexia Nervosa with speaker Dr. Stephen Tullis. My name is Dawn Gannon. I am the Deputy Executive Director for the Academy and your moderator for this evening. If you have any questions or concerns about this webinar, please feel free to reach out to me directly at the AED headquarters via email at gannon at aedweb.org or if it's easier for you to remember, you can just send an email to admin at aedweb.org. I can also be reached by dialing 703-234-4125 in the U.S. and by adding a plus one outside the U.S. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. All participants are muted with the exception of our speaker, myself, and the Academy's Communications Manager, Etta Carter, who's also joining us today. Um, you'll hear um, a request for the slides to be changed. That will be Etta taking care of that for us. Thank you so much. Um, in just a few minutes, the presentation will begin, after which the uh, question and answer portion of the presentation will be. The talk is going to be about 45 minutes. So um, please feel free to submit your questions to me during the presentation by using the text box, the chat box, on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, once we get to that portion, I'll read the question to you, um, and uh, then you'll get uh, some answers. If we don't have time for all of the question and answers, um, we'll also give you the um, contact information for Dr. Tula. So, thank you for uh, joining us again this evening. Let's begin by, by uh, doing an introduction. For those who don't know him, Stephen Toys obtained his PhD degree from the University of Cape Town in 1976. He was one of the first to investigate the effects of clozapine pardon me for not pronouncing that correctly, on the architecture of sleep right, and was instrumental in establishing the first sleep laboratory in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cape Town. He went on to complete his clinical internship at Brookshore Hospital um, for acute psychiatry, Valsenberg Hospital for general psychiatry and chronic mental illness, and the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital, where a specialist an internship in child psychology. In 1978, he was invited to take up a co-joint appointment as a clinical psychologist at Royal St. Alfred Hospital and clinical lecturer in psychology at the University of Sydney, Australia, where he was um, restayed from 1978 to 1988. Um, as a clinical, excuse me, as a consultant clinical psychologist, Dr. Floyd obtained a wealth of experience in treating patients across the psychiatric spectrum, as well as providing high-level neuropsychology consultations to both adults and children. He's been the recipient of numerous research grants from Australia's leading research funding body. He's written seven books, one of which has been translated into both Italian and Japanese, over 300 papers, book chapters, and 350 conference abstracts. In 2012, he was given the prestigious Leadership and Research Award by the Academy for Eating Disorders in recognition of his pioneering research in the field of eating disorders. In 2014, he was awarded the first Lifetime Achievement Award by the Australian and New Zealand Academy of Eating Disorders and the Ian Campbell, excuse me, Ian Campbell Memorial Prize by the Clinical College of the Australian Psychological Society for his outstanding contribution to the profession. So without further ado, Dr. Toys, the audience is yours. Thanks very much, and after that introduction, I can probably go home. <laughs> thanks very much for that um, um, introduction, and I'd like to thank everyone who's joined this webinar um, this evening. Um, some of you are know it's, it's, it's bedtime almost, and it's a labor of love to be up so late, so thanks very much. Um, what I hope today is just to share some of my ideas about severe and enduring anorexia nervosa, and um, hopefully you'll also contribute to that debate moving forward. So could we have the next slide, please? We can move on to the next one. Um, you can email me clearly if there are issues that you want. Could we just go back one, please? We just skipped one.
we could just go back. Yes, um, I just like to start off with where we are today, and um, I've put up the slide of three individuals who've contributed a significant amount to our understanding of family-based treatment for anorexia nervosa. Uh, but despite the good work that these three people have done and many others, a recent study by Sloan Madden in Sydney showed that a 12-month follow-up of family-based treatment for adolescents with anorexia nervosa, if one set fairly high remission rates like ideal body weight of 95% and within one standard deviation of the EDE, then the remission rate to 12 months was only around 33 and a third percent. That did improve to about 48 percent after um, five years, um, where 60 percent still had mental health issues. So there's no doubt if we intervene early with adolescents, we get many of these patients completely better. But the data suggests not all go on to make a full recovery. Can we have the next slide, please? Chris Fairburn, as we know, has pioneered the uh, CBT treatment and CBTE treatment of patients with anorexia nervosa. Uh, likewise, has done some good studies to show that CBTE can again get a significant proportion of patients uh, better. But then again, not all patients respond. And depending what data you look at, about 50% of patients don't make a full recovery and go on to a longer enduring path with the illness. Can I have the next one please? And so I think that we have family-based treatments, we have CBT-based treatments, we have MANTRA developed in the UK by um, uh, Janet Treasure and Ulrika Smith, there's the SSCI treatment developed in New Zealand. We have many different treat IPT. We have many treatments for um, we use with patients with anorexia nervosa, and I think we've been trying to refine these treatments. But despite despite refining them, we are still not getting to where I think we should be in terms of successful outcome. Um, and Socrates said we need to start thinking. If you want to be a good poet. He said you need to, to have a little bit of madness and you have to think outside the square. And I don't think we should become inspired madmen, but I think we need to start thinking a little outside the square. That we keep refining existing treatments, they seem to make slight improvements to outcome, but really we're not getting the major shift that I think we should be getting. And as a result, uh, in, uh, not an insignificant number of our patients are going on to develop a more enduring form of this illness. Can I have the next one, please? The next one, please. And so over time, I've come to realize that um, um, we really need to start looking at the group of patients who don't go on to um, um, succeed with the treatments that we've um, uh, developed. And this is an under-researched group of patients, and it's really over the last few years that people have been paying more attention to the group of patients who don't respond to the treatments we have available. Next, this is the Journal of Eating Disorders that I'm editor of, and we open access journal which people can um, pick up um, um, new um, papers being published. And there's an editorial in there which I've given you about um, um, how we should sort of think about severe and enduring moving forward. Anorexia nervosa is not new. Morton described anorexia, a classical patient with anorexia nervosa, um, I think it was 1665 um, or 66. So we've known about this illness for several hundred years. And I think having known about this illness for so long, I would have hoped we'd be a little more successful in our overall outcome of treating these patients. Next, please. And there's again a, a quote from Richard Morton, clearly these patients were known several hundred years ago, they were recognized, but um, here in 2016, we are still struggling to treat a not insignificant number of these patients many years down the track. Next please. And we know that the term anorexia nervosa was coined by um, William Gull at the same year um, Charles Lesseg, whose picture you see now, um, 
saw patients that he defined as having anorexia hysteric cold. And again, we've, we've defined this illness and gave it a name around 1874. And again, I feel we should have moved a lot further in being able to more successfully treat um, larger numbers of these patients. Next, please. And this is Sir William Gold. We can move on to the next one, whose term actually st stuck. Um, the sex was in French, Gold's was in English, the English version stuck. If you look at the first guidelines that I believe ever published in anorexia nervosa, they weren't called guidelines as such, but Venables looked at how patients with anorexia nervosa should be treated. This takes us back to 1930, and you can see that he was much more optimistic than I am, that every patient could be persuaded to eat normally, the condition was hysterical, and no patient should remain uncured. Depending which data you look at, people talk about a mortality rate of around 20% and around 50% of patients who have some aspect of this illness for most of their lives. And he felt if the doctor should sit down and fight for every mouthful of food, it could take an hour or two per meal. And now with Maudsley family-based treatment, it's the parents who sit down with the patient and fight for every mouthful of food, which could take an hour or two or more per meal. Could I have the next one? And despite that, he felt the doctor must never lose his temper, and now the parents doing family-based treatment should not lose their temper. He also felt one should cure the anorexia before one starts on the psychology of the patient's symptoms, and he felt that special nurses are usually needed, and that's still the case today. Could I have the next one, please? Uh, I put my thoughts together with my colleagues, and a, a new book has come out which we've edited. Um, um, it's called Treating Severe and Enduring Anorexia Nervosa, a Clinician's Guide. So if anyone wants more information about severe and enduring, there's a book now that encapsulates much of the thought about severe and enduring, and many of my um, um, esteemed colleagues around the world have contributed towards this edited book. Could I have the next one, please? And that is just a quick glance because of time, but um, if you want to, you can um, go to the Routledge website and look at the individual um, contributors. But these are some of the individuals who contributed to this book on severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. Can I have the next slide, please? So we tried to cover all aspects, um, the specialist um, 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 treatments, the two treatments in the book are manualized um, um, CBT for severe and enduring, and manualized um, special support of clinical management for anorexia nervosa severe and enduring. Could we go to the next one, please? Mark Rego was an associate professor of psychiatry at Yale, who developed rheumatoid arthritis and eventually was unable to work. And he wrote a wonderful piece in the American Journal of Psychiatry of what it's like to be chronically ill. Um, and he said there's a lot to learn about being chronically ill, how to temper disappointment and good news as both will pass, what to do if anything about forging a new identity. Next, please. And I think what we often forget when we're treating severe and enduring anorexia nervosa, what it's like every day to get up with a chronic um, 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 illness. And he says this very, very well in this piece in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Um, from a psychiatrist's perspective who's become chronically ill with a physical illness, but nevertheless a chronic illness and what it's like to be chronically ill. Could I have the next one, please? So he says, what would he say if he was asked to speak on behalf of his um, um, fellow patients? Could I have the next one, please? He said, I'd like them to know the following. Being chronically ill is not like having a bad back or a bad breakup. Your life is greatly downsized, and in your new smaller quarters, there are more sharp edges, so you must be aware of a misstep. Thus, to try anything is a bad idea. You will have a cordial exchange about life, but you're a confederate expectator here, not a real participant. I think when we treat our patients with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa, we need to take some of these issues that he raises into um, um, awareness that these patients get up every day 
living with a chronic illness. Next, please. So the other thing we need to think about is we need to treat these patients, but often the treatments that we use um, for younger patients don't, or patients who've been ill for a short period of time don't seem to work for patients with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. Many of them have had multiple courses of CBT, good CBT, they've had admissions to hospital, but yet they don't seem to be able to overcome uh, their illness. Next, please. Most of these patients who do become chronically ill often lose their motivation to get better. They've tried, they've tried, they've failed, they've disappointed those around them, um, and they are petrified of even small increases in weight, and that becomes a pitched battle, often between the therapist trying to get the patient with severe and enduring anorexia to put on weight, and the patient's reluctance and resistance to want to do that. And one of the things we need to try and work through is we obviously don't want to get into a pitch battle here. It's um, um, obviously not going to be helpful in the long term. How we actually get these patients to improve their quality of life, improve their health, and make some of the changes that they need to do, which they're so petrified of doing. Next. So what are the clinical imperatives? The patient pushes against, especially with severe and enduring, these patients push hard against wanting to gain further weight. Um, uh, they believe that putting on weight is going to destroy their lives, and Michael Strobe has written a lot about this and written very elegantly about this. So they believe um, 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 that if they do gain weight, if they do start to advance in treatment, their life is going to be more miserable than it is at that particular point in time. And really the risk is, and one has to carefully manage, that some of these patients, if pushed too far too quickly, suicide becomes a real concern. Next, please. Trying to have a rational conversation with patients with severe enduring anorexia nervosa, that if they do the things we would like them to do, um, the patient's life would be so much better. It's just unpersuasive. The patient doesn't actually see it in the same way. So trying to use sort of rational thinking with many of these patients falls flat because the patient really isn't persuaded by the argument. The fear of changing is so great, it's a neophobia, that they feel that making the changes is going to make their life even worse than it is at that point in time. Next, please. Yeah, so I think clinicians often become extremely frustrated um, 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 because the argument is so rational, the family are there when they are still there and often the family have become exhausted and moved away. But here we are, we can help you to improve your life. But really the patient's just not able to grasp uh, the fundamentals of what we're trying to get them to do here. And therefore it becomes a frustrating battle. You know what you think is best for the patient and the patient is pushing back on all fronts. Next. And Joanne Steingross has done some interesting um, 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 work and um, her data is suggesting that when habits are established at lower weights, they become much more entrenched. And she's arguing that some of the reasons as to why this may be so hard for these patients to change is that these behaviors have become much more entrenched because some of them have been entrenched at a much lower weight. Next. 
So there's some neural underpinnings for why this might be that these patients are so hard to change. So the staff brain may be more prone to utilizing efficient cognitive strategies such as habit mechanisms, and by directly examining food choices in individuals with AN, we have shown that this behavior is mediated by the dorsal striatum, which suggests a potential link with habit neural circuits. So there's some neural underpinnings being worked on, and this is an exciting kind of area where um, advances have been made in understanding severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. Next, please. Australia has developed the most recent guidelines for the treatment of anorexia nervosa, and it's the first guidelines ever to have a section devoted entirely to severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. And in those guidelines, I don't have time to go through all of them, but comprehensive assessment, simple attainable goals, primary focus on global adaptive functioning, um, um, restoration of specific body weight should not be mandatory, and that's probably where it differs from many um, um, others where we're pushing patients and should be pushing younger patients to get to a normal healthy body weight. The guidelines in Australia suggest with severe and enduring, that's not a mandatory requirement. We'll try and get patients as well as we possibly can get them. Next, please. One tries to improve nutrition, interpersonal functioning. Uh, you try and get them involved with psychologically minded physicians. Often family members are ill-informed and still pushing for recovery, which may not be possible. And where possible, you need a highly experienced multidisciplinary team. These are very difficult patients to treat. Um, individual, uh, therapists who treat these patients as uh, on their own in individual therapy without a team would find it extremely difficult because they are complex, they're difficult, they're demanding, and they need so many different uh, inputs. They're treating these patients in terms of multidisciplinary team in my opinion, is a far better way to go than trying to treat them on your own. Next, please. Often these patients, if you push them too hard, say they're going to go, this is too hard, they've tried it all before, and I think what you do with any patient is make sure that they're safe, leave the door open for them to come back, um, um, and, and many then do, they go away for a while, decide that they'd like to come back. So I think leaving that door open and not leaving them with a the feeling that they've failed but they're grappling with a severe debilitating illness I think is a very good um, option. Leave that door open where you can and make sure, especially those at very low weight, that they've been medically managed out in the community. Next, please. And many clinicians who haven't had a good background and experience in treating anorexia nervosa end up trying to treat patients with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa often feel these patients are just too hard to treat and feel they're not going to take on any more such patients. Um, and in practice, I would advise any clinicians um, who um, are part of this today is not to take too many severe and enduring patients on at any one time. They're demanding they're tough to treat, you're up against a formidable kind of illness, and if you take on too many, you're going to find that um, it's going to become uh, quite a, a significant challenge for yourself. So the advice is take on, if you're going to take these patients on, don't take on too many. I would think one at a time would be enough, but if you're going to take on two, but probably no more than that, unless you're working within a unit where you've got a lot of support from colleagues. Next, please. Okay, I just want to talk very briefly, and this has been published in Psychological Medicine, so you can go back and read the actual article. This is the first, I understand, multi-center trial looking at two treatments for patients with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. All patients in this trial had severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. There are many studies that have been done in the past, treatment studies, which have had some patients with severe and enduring as part of their patient group. This study had all the patients in the study all had severe and enduring, and we compared Kathy Pike's cognitive behavior therapy, flexible CBT, developed for severe and enduring anorexia nervosa with a New Zealand-based specialist supportive clinical management. 
both these treatments have been described in the book that I've mentioned. So if anyone wants the details of the treatment, which I don't have time to go into, that's available in, in the book if you want to, to get more details about that. Can I move on to the next one? There are a number of colleagues who um, supported me in this. Daniel LaGrange, in, uh, then in Chicago, now in San Francisco, Hubert Lacey in London and Philippa Hay. We've got a lot of support, financial support from Australia, from the UK. Can we move to the next one? And lots of individuals contributed to this multi-centre trial, both in London and in Sydney. Next one, please. I led the Sydney team. Hubert Lacey led the London team. We had clear distinction delineation between assessors and therapists. Therapists treated, assessors assessed, therapists weren't involved in the data, the assessors weren't involved in the treatment. All data went to Chicago as a data collection center, and only when the study was absolutely completed was the data actually um, revealed. Next, please. CBT was, both treatments in the end um, um, were successful, uh, but CBT at follow-up showed uh, uh, slight advantages over SSCM. Um, so CBT did demonstrate some greater um, um, improvements on primary outcome measures. This study was different to most other studies that the primary outcome measures were mental health related quality of life eating disorder symptoms, motivation for change and healthcare burden, and the secondary outcome was weight. Uh, weight was important to us, and we wanted these patients to gain weight, but we didn't make treatment all revolve around weight. We hoped by changing quality of life, we'd also be able to change weight. We randomized 63 medically stable um, adults to either CBT or SSCM, and they had to, if they were on medication, they had to be at least two months stable on medication to meet entry requirements. Next, please. They had eight months of treatment, 27 and a half contact hours, 33 50-minute sessions in both CBT um, or, or SSCM, and we did independent assessments at baseline, at the end of treatment, at six months, 12 months, and we've recently completed a five-year follow-up. Next, please. And that just shows the um, assessment times again, um, baseline, end of treatment, six month and 12 month follow up. We did some of the treatment assessments as well. If you look at the study flowchart, um, um, there were 159 screened by telephone. I'm not sure why this hasn't come out, but 159 screened and 63. Many patients didn't leave, live in Sydney. Um, they were already in treatment elsewhere, and so 63 met criteria out of the 159 that we screened. Next, please. If you look at some of the baseline criteria of these patients, and I don't have too much time to, to go into this, but the sad thing was here that many of these patients, um, if one looks at the SSCM, um, 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 that um, many of these patients, and in the CBT group, they had college degrees. Um, a significant number had college degrees, yet if you look at the employment, um, um, the employment record did not match the um, um, academic achievements. So this illness long term has a dramatic impact on their lives, not only psychologically, medically, socially, but also from an employment point of view. Despite having a high number of them having um, college degrees, um, when you look at the employment, it clearly didn't match the um, level of um, tertiary education that many of them had. And again, in terms of partners, etc., again, this illness has, if it goes on to become severe and enduring, a significant impact on all aspects of the patient's life. Next, please. So we use two treatment sites deliberately, Sydney and London. We use manualized treatment experience therapists, weekly supervision. Ross Crosby looked at the data, so we had good statistical input from Fargo, from Ross Crosby. We had low attrition. This study, um, uh, we managed to maintain 85% of patients through to one year follow-up. And it's one of the first studies that's maintained um, um, patients in such treatment. We know that patients don't 
often stay in treatment with anorexia nervosa, but one of the standout features of this trial at 12 months follow-up that 85% of patients had completed the treatment and we used um, appropriate outcome measures. Can we go to the next one, please? There are always limitations. Um, um, we had to have, since we were treating fairly severely ill patients as outpatients, we had um, compulsory medical monitoring for all these patients. Um, um, the initial data were 12 months, but as I say, we just now have five-year follow-up data on them. Um, and they were treated in two university-based clinical settings. Um, and we had a modest sample in the N63 patients. Those were some of the limitations. Next, please. So retention at follow-up was 85%, which was quite remarkable. Kathy Halmy has argued, until we can get patients to stay in treatment, we shouldn't be running more randomized controlled trials. But having the primary outcome measure as quality of life, that weight gain was strongly encouraged but not mandatory. We were able to keep 85% of patients um, in treatment. Both groups in, improved, so both psychological treatments. Um, patients improved on the majority of outcome measures. Um, um, and there were really no major differences between treatment groups at end of treatment and follow-up. Could I have the next one, please? But CBT seemed to be a little better than um, um, SSCM. CBT patients had higher scores on social adjustment, and at 12 months, CBT reported lower EDE global scores and higher readiness to change. So even though there was no significant difference between the two treatments, CBT that targets the core symptoms seemed to have done a little better on those particular um, um, factors. Next, please. So what are the implications of this study? And I think it needs to be replicated and we need many more studies like this. Um, it suggests that even if you have a severe and enduring anorexia nervosa, you can still make significant and meaningful improvements with therapy. Um, and as I said, CBT showed some significant advantage at follow-up over SSCM in terms of social adjustment, core eating pathology, and readiness to change, but no differences in health-related quality of life or healthcare utilization. Next, please. And just quickly, the five-year follow-up, and I don't have time to go through all of it, but if you look at the um, five-year follow-up, most of these patients maintained the gains that they'd made at the end of treatment. Um, most patients um, um, had done, had made gains during treatment and at five-year follow-up had maintained many of the gains that they'd made. And that's again a very sort of promising finding. Unfortunately, our numbers had fallen quite significantly um, um, by the time we did the five-year follow-up. So we had 85% at the end of treatment, but trying to maintain contact with these patients is extremely difficult. And as you can see, the numbers there of 28 um, at the five-year follow-up says we can't say too much about the five-year follow-up data other than patients seem to have maintained the progress they've made during treatment. Next, please. On the back, um, patients had improved their depression had got significantly better between baseline um, and end of treatment. Um, it had again started to move up by the five-year follow-up, but at five-year follow-up it was still significantly different to baseline, um, but it had um, increased, their depression had lifted, um, 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 the depression had, sorry, not lifted, the depression had become a little more severe than it was at um, the end of treatment and the end of follow-up, 12-month um, follow-up. So the depression had come back a bit, but it was still significantly different from baseline. Could I have the next one, please? And again, the EDE global scores, and clearly what this is showing, it's low numbers, but what this is showing is that patients were able to maintain the improvements five years um, um, at five-year follow-up, the improvements they had made during the actual treatment. Next, please. And that's similar kind of finding. Patients seem to maintain the improvement they had made. Could I have the next one, please? 
And the social adjustment scale, again, it's the same thing. They've improved their social functioning and they've maintained that at five-year follow-up. So I'd like to now look at, there are some programs that have now been developed worldwide that cater specifically for patients with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. There's that one such program now at the Toronto General Hospital that Blake Woodside's involved in. Could have the next one, please. And um, Hubert Lacey in, in, in um, London has what's called a compulsory recovery program. And I'll just sort of share a little bit with you. Um, these are patients who've experienced a number of failed treatment episodes, including time under the Mental Health Care um, Act there. They have to have, an, to get into their compulsory recovery program, they have to have been ill for at least um, 10 years. Could I have the next one? And um, unless they responded to this particular program, then the unit that Professor Lacey would run would say, you now end up with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. We're going to give you one trial in our compulsory recovery program. If you aren't able to meet um, and, and improve with this particular program, then we're going to say that you probably have a severe and enduring um, um, anorexia nervosa. And he, he says it's a calculated clinical attempt to prevent the patient from moving from AN to severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. So could we just go to the next slide, please? They set a target weight of a BMI of 20. There's an intensive set psychotherapeutic input into this um, um, program. Um, if they lose, if their weight starts to decline in any way, and he says a gram below 20, a BMI of 20 on two occasions, they readmitted, and they readmitted under uh, a compulsory health act. If, um, so they have to come back in, and each time they would restore their weight to a BMI of 20 plus one kilogram. So this is a, a, a program designed to try and ensure that these patients continue to keep their BMI at at least 20 or above. And the feeling here is if you aren't able to do this, then you're really heading down a severe and enduring course. Next, please. Could I have the next slide? Okay. Seven patients have undergone this compulsory recovery program, all under the age of 25. Average duration of illness is eight years. They've all previously been treated under the Mental Health Act. All had poor quality of life, social exclusion, and failure to reach their potential. And all of them came into the unit under legal order because the referring doctors had judged they were a danger to themselves. So, so far, these are seven patients who's participated in this trial. They've all been come into hospital under legal order, and once they go out, if they lose any weight, they are obliged to come in under legal um, order. So I thought I'd just share with you what happens if you take these patients who've really been struggling for at least eight years and give them no option but the fact that they have to, under legal order, come in and gain weight. So let's look at the data of these uh, relating to these seven patients. Next, please. Two patients failed to reach a BMI of 20 and withdrew from the study. So the two of the patients they couldn't get, despite their psychotherapeutic um, ward, multidisciplinary team, lots of therapy, a lot of encouragement to get these patients to BMI of 20. Out of the seven, two failed to reach a BMI of 20. Two patients reached a BMI of 20. Um, uh, they subsequently withdrew from the study. And then three patients initially held their weight. Um, um, and one of those was removed from the study um, on a, uh, um, um, against the advice of the uh, treatment team and now has a BMI of 18. And the other two have held their discharge weights. So out of the seven patients, this compulsory recovery program, two seem to be holding their discharge weights and the other five, for various reasons, were unable to continue to do so. Next, please. So if we go back to the program that Blake Woodside and um, 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 Alan Kaplan had, uh, 
These, in Toronto, it provides community-based care for 30 participants. There's an inpatient unit. This is the outpatient unit. Um, uh, there's no predetermined discharge date when they come in, and most patients have been in the program since inception and likely to be in it for the rest of their lives. So this is a program where he, uh, Professor Kaplan says, Alan Kaplan says, these are patients who've been orphaned by the ED treatment system. They're able to come into an inpatient unit. You negotiate what they're prepared to achieve during their time in um, hospital. It's negotiable between the patient and the therapist. Clearly, there's some non-negotiables. And then they also helped in an outpatient setting. And these patients can move in and out of this program um, depending on what their needs are. It's just, and, and, and the data shows, I think, that many of these patients have been there since the program started. So many of them haven't been able to move that far forward with overcoming the illness, but rely on this program to maintain the quality of life that they've managed to establish for themselves. Next, please. So Alan says, and, um, and this is Toronto program, to provide timely, client-centered, individualized, community-based support. It focuses on quality of life issues, um, vocational training, housing support, social support. Next, please. And then what this program does do, it has a palliative care approach. And uh, this sort of arises, um, um, ethical issues arise, um, clinicians feel very strongly one way or another about palliative care when it comes to anorexia nervosa, but the decision to adopt a palliative care approach must be made on a case-by-case -case basis, ideally after consultation with bioethicists and your palliative care experts, and with the full consent of substitute decision makers, parents and spouse, and such an individualized patient and family-centered approach will assure that the physician is upholding the most important element of the Hippocratic Oath. And some of these patients reach a point in life where they clearly say they no longer wish to live, the illness is too devastating, their quality of life is too poor, and in Toronto they're developing this palliative care approach with lots of guidelines um, um, put in, which is what would be needed, bioethicists, palliative care experts, consent of family, but clinicians feel very strongly one way or another, whether we should keep battling on with such patients, uh, they have a psychiatric illness, or whether patients who feel they no longer wish to um, endure this illness should have the opportunity to make that kind of decision. Next slide, please. And Alan says the final decision must reflect careful considerations of the concept central to healthcare ethics, beneficence, the potential for improvement, non-maleficence, and the likelihood of doing harm. So this has to be a case-by-case -case basis. You have to think it through very carefully. The patient says, I don't want to have to go through any more treatment. I've had multiple admissions to hospital, nasogastric feeding, um, involuntary treatments. Enough is enough. I don't want more, any more of that. And these are very, very difficult, um, um, complex, and challenging decisions that clinicians sometimes have to consider. Next, please. And this is a parent whose child, I believe, went through such a program. And these are very powerful words from um, um, a mother who said, palliative care was a gift that was given to me. It was a time when I could reconnect with my daughter after many years of being alienated from her. A time I could show A my love and she was open to accept it. Because we didn't react to her, she didn't want to eat, she didn't have to eat, there wasn't that anxiety and the positive atmosphere and sense that we were all in this together opened up the opportunity for her to accept our help living with the illness. I think it's a very powerful statement by a mother who has lost her child to anorexia nervosa. Next, please. Just very briefly, um, where are we heading with, with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa? Clearly many more of these patients now are receiving pharmacotherapy. Um, the two drugs that seem to be used um, fairly frequently are lanzapine and quetiapine. 
There's non-invasive neuromodulation that's now been tried, transcranial magnetic stimulation and transcranial direct current stimulation. Next, please. And there's more invasive treatments that are now being considered, such as deep brain stimulation, which is a neurosurgical placement of electrodes um, and that delivers a current to specific areas of the brain. And there are now papers that have been published on deep brain stimulation in anorexia nervosa. Next, please. And the ethics of this has been challenged. Um, um, Park and Tan. Um, um, in at ICD, ICED meeting in Boston in 2015 in a workshop entitled Giving Hope to the Hopeless or Exploiting the Vulnerable, the Ethics of Deep Brain Stimulation Research for Anorexia Nervosa. Clearly these patients are desperate, clearly these patients feel that everything else has failed um, and um, deep brain stimulation may offer some hope but again there's no there isn't yet sufficient evidence to show that this is a long term, going to help them in the long term, and some of the ethics about doing such research has been raised. Next, please. And this is one of the papers in BMC Psychiatry, which says, is deep brain stimulation a treatment option for anorexia nervosa? And my concern is, in the absence of stronger psychological treatments that can be shown to work with this particular group, other options are going to become available and one of them um, is deep brain stimulation and so there's a debate developing in the literature about the use of deep brain stimulation in um, anorexia nervosa. Next please. Um, Walt Kay in San Diego is starting to adapt or has adapted his psychological treatments to take into consideration the neurobiology of this illness and has developed a novel approach to treating chronic disorder in San Francisco and his treatment strategies clearly are paying more and more attention to the neurobiology of this illness and trying to incorporate neurobiological aspects into the treatment especially for those um, um, who have a severe and enduring form of the illness. Next please. Um, males, um, Ted Wilson's done um, a lot of work with males um, um, and we often forget and I don't have time today to spend too much time on males but males go on to develop anorexia nervosa. I believe we underdiagnose males because general practitioners often aren't alerted to the fact that um, you know, males do get, a significant number of males do get anorexia nervosa and males often don't uh, want to get um, uh, identified as having anorexia nervosa because they consider it to be a stigma having a female illness. So I'm of the opinion that there are many more males with anorexia nervosa and um, but they, they aren't coming forward for treatment necessarily and we aren't studying them enough because um, we don't get sufficient numbers to drive our power in our various studies. But I think males is an area and especially what happens to males longer term um, uh, is something we need to pay attention to. Next please. Uh, Wilson believes that rates of EDs in males will continue to increase and so a proportion of those will go on to develop um, um, severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. So males is a group that we need to pay more attention to. So just to conclude and now get on to questions that Treatment of the chronically ill demands awareness of the related customs by which these patients insist they must live without deviating from routines, without contemplations of alternatives or new possibilities. That makes treatment very difficult. It requires an understanding of why it's hazardous to ask patients with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa to challenge their routines too soon or too forcefully. When one does that, the patient either doesn't come back to treatment or you could end up your patient becoming much more suicidal and depressed. It requires understanding of the deeply entrenched principles of living that evolved from their biology and our intervening developmental unease gave increasing strength to their illness. So treating these patients is a challenge, um, requires the, um, uh, a huge degree of patience um, and one of the things we should always remember is if we're going to effect change in these patients is not to push them too hard too quickly. If we get change over time with these patients, that's a great outcome. I'll
stop there now and um, um, allow you to ask some questions. Thank you for um, um, staying with me, especially those late at night. Thank you so much for such a, uh, an informative presentation. Um, I actually learned quite a bit myself, so thank you for that. Um, if anyone has questions, um, please look at the look at your um, screen on the right hand side. There's a box that says questions. You can um, type in your questions, and I will um, ask them. And we can. Okay. Here's a question uh, for you. Are we giving patients with AN enough time during the motivational enhancement stage of CBT and to really consider changing and preparing them to engage in behavioral change? Yes. Um, you'll see in this in, in our trial, which is the only one I said which is uh, taken on only patients with severe and enduring, we had an option to which CBT to use in this trial. And we chose to use Kathy Pike's CBT that she's developed in New York for um, um, treating patients with anorexia nervosa. And she modified that for severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. And what's built into that CBT is great flexibility for motivational enhancement therapy. That there's little point in trying to um, get the patient to change if they're not ready to change. So in the CBT we used in our trial, we were able to spend as many sessions of that CBT as we, as we deem fit to try and get the patients motivated to change. So that's a very good question. And with these patients, you have to do a great deal of uh, motivational work because trying to induce change when the patient's not going to consider that means all you do is you get into a confrontation. So motivational enhancement work is crucial with these patients and you need to have a therapy that allows you to spend as much time, sometimes several months or even longer, just to try and engage these um, patients in treatment. That's a good question, thank you. Okay. Um, one of the other, I, we only, the only other question that we have um, is what about MI? You know, I think motivational interviewing, it's the same thing. I think that um, if the patient is not ready to change, then trying to get the patient to undertake a treatment where the main emphasis of the treatment is change. And I guess the point I kept stressing was that in our trial, we had an 85% retention rate. Um, and we put a lot of effort into keeping the patients in the trial. It was a clinical trial and we engaged patients and we um, sent them newsletters and uh, we kept updating um, them about um, issues that they needed to know, etc. Um, so we, we made an effort to keep them. But <clears throat> many patients with severe and enduring treatment drop out of treatment. So any kind of motivational work you can do. And not everyone agrees with that. Some people feel, well, if your patient's not going to um, accept the treatment you're offering, then are you colluding with the patient in terms of not actually changing? So some people have an alternate view and feel that, um, you know, if you want to recover from anorexia nervosa, you ultimately have to put on weight. And if you're not going to be able to do that, you're never going to get better. So by allowing a patient to um, uh, be in pre-contemplation or contemplation, you're not actually allowing the patient to change. Um, and some people would feel that you're colluding with the patient. If you said to the patient, come back when you're ready to change, would that be more motivating to the patient? Um, we sort of erred on the side of doing lots of motivational interviewing and lots of um, um, work in trying to motivate the patient to accept that they need to make some decisions about their life. We don't make weight gain mandatory, but we strongly encourage weight gain. We have non-negotiables. Um, and in the London arm of the trial, two patients actually went on to have children, have babies. So it does show that if you are able to sit with some of these patients long enough, motivate them to do something about their lives, um, they end up um, um, making the changes that they need, ne that, that are necessary to vastly improve their lives. Okay. Um, another question or comment. Um, considering that you're suggesting that it may take several months, does it need to be inpatient 
are day patient or can this be completed outpatient with the support of medical monitoring, in your opinion? Okay, another good question. Um, I mentioned Blake Woodside. Blake Woodside has a unit in Toronto where you come in as a severe and enduring patient and you are treated very differently to a patient who doesn't have severe and enduring. So the, the program that many patients with severe and enduring anorexia get into are patients that are more acute, haven't had it for nearly as long, and they're forced into a milieu program that they feel so uncomfortable with. They've been there, done it so many times before. They refuse to stay or refuse to go in. So Blake Woodside has a program where he starts with a blank sheet of paper and you and the patient work out what you're going to achieve on that admission with some non-negotiables put in. Um, I think it really depends. These patients require very careful medical monitoring. Um, many of them um, are at risk and clearly a non-negotiable would be that if your medical condition determines that you need to be in hospital, well then you need to be in hospital and maybe only in hospital until your medical status improves and you're no longer medically unstable. Um, we've run day hospital programs exclusively for patients with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa and patients are more likely then to come into such a program. So I really think it depends on what's available. But if you're going to treat them as an outpatient, make sure that they have good medical monitoring because often these patients um, um, do get into a medical crisis and then you have to make a decision as to what you're going to do and it's always better to have those non-negotiables locked in right at the beginning so that you don't have that confrontation when they do become medically unstable. That's another good point, thank you. Okay, uh, the, another question that we have is what role does over-evaluation of shape and weight play in maintaining um, severe and enduring anorexia nervosa? Certain body uh, excuse me, certain approaches de-emphasize the focus on body dissatisfaction. The cognitive interpersonal model de-emphasizes uh, a critical challenge in SEA and is that much of the psychopathy can be explained by effects of starvation and traits such as um, excuse me, obsessionality and, yeah, and, and harm avoidance are exaggerated. Nutrition rehabilitation may mitigate these effects and make therapy more effective. Indeed, higher BMI is associated with greater QOL. However, it seems that if some weight restoration is achieved in SEAN, relapse is still common. There is a question here, I promise. Could it be that once a target weight is reached, over-evaluation of shape and weight becomes more prominent, once again unduly influencing shape and weight on self-evaluation? Okay. So, That's a, yeah, the one, yeah. Just one more comment. If so, this may be the catalyst for relapse and severe weight loss. Okay, yeah. Uh, the difficult problem here is um, when patients are in a pitch battle not to gain weight, um, clearly weight gain helps. And um, um, no, I don't think anyone would argue against that. I mean, you could get everyone with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa to reach a normal healthy weight. That's clearly the outcome we would desire. Reality dictates that's not going to happen at this point in time, and many patients simply won't accept that. You can get some weight on them, but they often leave hospital and lose it again. And, and the argument is, does severe malnutrition and being underweight um, result in um, uh, many of these uh, um, symptoms that we um, talk about and gaining weight means that some of these um, 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 overt sort of psychological symptoms may be reduced by weight gain. I mean the problem with this group of patients is how you get the weight gain. Um, um, and the other thing I found, and this is not part of our trial but it's anecdotal, that with many of these more severe and enduring patients, um, concerns about their weight, uh, a body shape, is not nearly as great as it was when they first developed the illness. The illness seems to change with time and that's something we haven't studied. We make the assumption here that the illness at 30 years is the same as the illness you got when you first got it and I don't believe that's the case and we've developed a staging model to show that you go into different stages of this illness. The illness, anorexia nervosa is not the same 
uh, it's not a homogeneous illness. And I think the illness you have 30 years later is different to the illness that you first um, 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 get. Um, but to get back to the point, I think in these patients, if you push the weight gain too much, it does cause greater distress about their body shape, something that they felt they could cope with before and now can't cope with. So if you're going to do that, you need to do it very, very gradually. Um, the, the issue is how to get these patients to gain weight. Um, and they, they, they stuck because any weight gain to them is a neophobia, a great fear of changing weight. Uh, if we get them to change weight, then I think some of the symptoms like mood may will, will probably improve, but we can't get them to, to do that initially, and that's where part of this problem with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa is. I'm not sure I've entirely answered the question, um, um, but I think that gaining weight does not make your concerns about your body shape necessarily get better. It sometimes does to make it get worse, and those patients then struggle a lot more. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple more questions, but if, um, our hour is up. But really quickly, one um, person is asking to share, um, if you would share your references, and I think this would be a really good time if you could give them your con give everyone your contact information if they need further um, information. You can you can share that with them really quickly, and then um, someone would like for you to briefly talk about SSVM, and I, after that we're going to close the uh, the webinar. Okay, SSCM, Special Support of Clinical Management, is a therapy that's been developed in New Zealand by Jenny McIntosh um, and, um, and Jenny Jordan, um, and uh, uh, it's, it's a treatment that, it's different to CBT because it provides no homework whatsoever, it provides no monitoring. CBT is very strong on monitoring, it's very strong on homework, it's very strong on what needs to be achieved at each session. SSCM is much more flexible. The patient can help determine where the therapy is going. No homework is, is, is given. No monitoring is prescribed. A lot of psychoeducation material is given to the patient, but it's not checked whether they're actually reading the material. If they bring it back into session, they can bring it back into session. So it's a treatment that does focus on trying to get these patients to take more responsibility. It's good clinical management, but it is different to CBT in terms of monitoring, in terms of homework, um, and it allows the patient to set the agenda a lot more than um, it does in um, CBT. Okay, well, we'll so thank, you. Thank, you. thank you again. Thanks. I'm not sure if that's where we end, but if we are ending soon, I'd like to thank everyone for um, participating um, um, in this webinar. This is an area we need to drive forward, the more people who become interested in this area, because there are lots of patients who unfortunately, despite all our good efforts, we've worked hard with them, they've had the best treatments available, but yet they still have this debilitating illness. And it's that group of patients I feel we need to pay more attention to and develop better treatments so their lives and their quality of lives can be improved further. Great, wonderful. Thank you for, for again for such a wonderful presentation. Can you give everyone your contact information in case um, their questions weren't answered and like I said, someone was asking for your references? Um, what, how can they reach you? I'll give you my email address now. The Australian New Zealand Academy of Eating Disorder Meeting is in New Zealand next week, so I'm actually away for a week, so I will try and answer questions as quickly as I can. But the best way to contact me would be Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, dot T-O-U-Y-Z, at Sydney, S-Y-D-N-E-Y, dot E-D-U, dot A-U. I just repeat that, S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot T-O-U-Y-Z at Sydney, S-Y-D-N-E-Y dot E-D-U dot A-U. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much again for your presentation. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, just a reminder, our next webinar is September the 12th. You'll be getting an email about that soon, hopefully. Um, you'll sign up for that one as well. Um, this webinar will be posted on the AED website um, within the next day or two. Again, thank you everyone for participating and enjoy either the rest of your evening or the rest of your day. Thank you.